Welcome to the Latin American Perspectives Podcast. My name is Alexander Scott. I'm your host, and I'm recording this podcast for you from my apartment in Southern California. For today's podcast, I met with LAP founding editor Ron Chilcote and contributing editor Joanna Salem to discuss their recent double issue of LAP titled Reassessing Development, Dependency Theories and Debates that was recently released in January and March of 2022. Now, before we jump into the interview, I want to say that obviously I find all of the issues that we publish here at LAP to be incredibly insightful and interesting, but I cannot stress enough just how incredible and thought-provoking I think these two issues are. If you have any interest in the history of development and exploitation in Latin America, Marxist political economic theory, or just learning about the rich history of Latin American intellectualism in the 20th century, this issue is a absolute must-read, and I encourage you to get a copy as soon as possible. Ronald Chilcote is Managing Editor of Latin American Perspectives and the Edward A. Dixon Emeritus Professor of Economics and Political Science at the University of California, Riverside. He's the author of over 20 books, as well as numerous book chapters and individual articles. Joana Salem Vasconcelos is a professor of contemporary history at the Facultad Caspero Libero in Brazil and a coordinating editor of Latin American Perspectives. Her book, Historia Agraria de Revolução Cubana, Dilemas do Socialismo no Periferia, was published by Alameda Press in 2017. An English translation of the book is forthcoming and will be published by Brill Publications. Now, let's get to the interview. Ron and Joanna, welcome to the Latin American Perspectives podcast. Thank you so much for making the time to be here with me. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Good to be with you. Now, before we get into the larger theme of the issue and discussing potentially some of the articles. I was hoping, Ron, you could provide our listeners with a brief overview of the issue and how it came about. Well, the issue really came about because Joanna had come to uh, University of California, Irvine, to do some work on her doctoral dissertation. And and, uh, we were traveling together to meetings of Latin American Perspectives. And in the process began to talk about dependency because Joanna uh, let me know that there was a debate going on in Brazil and elsewhere that I had, I had been paying any attention to, nor had the editors of Latin American Perspectives uh, been aware. And, uh, and this was of great importance because it, it, it's what got the Latin American Perspectives started in the first place. And we went through a series of debates we published a lot of material. Uh, there was great interest around the world in what we were doing. And then it kind of faded away in the uh, 1990s. And Joanna was really bringing forward to me um, the, the discussion in Brazil, in particular, that she was very aware of. And in discussing it, we somehow came to the conclusion that we should launch an issue. And we put together perspectives uh, around the questions of development in general, uh, but in dependency, and in particular, the Marxist influences upon dependency, because those are that is what was interested of interest to us originally uh, back in the 1970s, and it was in the 1970s that things really began to change in, in the social sciences, which had been dominated by the North American and Eurocentric perspectives, and particularly around questions of development, which, which uh, continued to, to emphasize that capitalist development as had occurred in the United States and in, in uh, England could be reproduced uh, elsewhere, especially in the third world, countries that were less developed, underdeveloped, and uh, trying to, to, to move forward in progressive ways. 
So that was the dilemma. And it was uh, in the late 60s and the early 70s that this paradigm began to shift. This vision of development began to shift. And it was the Latin American intellectuals who had a tremendous role in this. So a group of us uh, who had been trying to launch an alternative journal to the Latin American Research Review, which was the journal of the Latin American Studies Association founded 1966 by Common Silbert, uh, Frank Bonilla, and others. The younger generation that became associated with LASA, as it was called, was concerned about that journal. Uh, the journal focused on fieldwork in Latin America, and that was important to us, but it was not dealing with the issues of uh, Latin America. And our feeling was that there was a need for focus on the issues, and furthermore, the association uh, failed to, to bring Latin American scholars into its, into its proceedings, especially at its first Congress, where they were attended by 200 people, where there were no Latin Americans uh, on, the, on the executive board. And there were only uh, two women attending a conference of maybe 200 people. But attending the, and dominating the conference were nine really well-established, well-known scholars of Latin America, all North Americans, uh, who, some of whom had been my teachers at Stanford University and uh, who I had to listen to in their courses and found that at the, at the first meeting uh, in all the panels, all the panels were, were dominated by these nine men, um, including no Latin Americans, no women. So, so the younger generation became concerned about that and we had a business meeting and we introduced a number of resolutions which actually began to, to win the day we almost, uh, we're in a position to take over the old the, the journal that had been supported by money uh, that had come from the Ford Foundation, the U.S. government. We were really concerned. These were the years of uh, just concern and uh, debates among among the youth, academic youth, in the United States and throughout the world. 1968 was a, was a big year, as we all know. So, in 1970. Uh, the younger generation proposed in a business meeting of LASA an alternative journal. We called it, uh, it was to be called the Journal of Latin American Opinion or something of that nature. And the vote was uh, about 80% in favor of an alternative journal to what LASA had. So uh, that and other resolutions that were quite interesting uh, all passed by the progressive grouping uh, within LASA and LASA was now growing and Latin Americans were beginning to come into its membership. The consequence of that was that I was asked by LASA to put together a proposal for an alternative journal. And we put together um, a proposal, asked for $5,000, eventually submitted it. And the executive committee, uh, these pretty much the same people who had founded the organization, uh, decided they didn't have enough funds, even though they had just received a grant of $100,000 from the Ford Foundation. So that led to the founding of, of Latin American Perspectives because I had been working with 11 others and the 12 of us had uh, come up with the proposal which we had taken to the LASA meeting in 1973 at Wisconsin and we proposed a new journal of Latin American perspectives. There were about 125 to 150 people attending that. It was unanimously, it was unanimously agreed to, and we launched the journal and uh, I agreed to be the managing editor for a period of 25 years, but I'm now in my 49th year and um, it's been a long haul. So the first issue is what got it all started. The first issue dealt with dependency and dependency theory. I wrote an introductory piece that uh, dealt with the literature, um, the main literature. We invited Andre Gunder Frank to submit a piece, which was quite interesting because it was his reply. He was an economist 
his reply was to some 50 critics in Latin America of his idea that development should be looked at in a different way. The development was, should be looked at in terms of underdevelopment and that capitalism did, would not generate progress and development, but backwardness. And this idea, I think, for the most part, came from Paul Buran, who was one of my teachers at Stanford, who had written a book on uh, Latin America, uh, written a book on, on underdevelopment uh, called um, Political Economy of Growth, which became a bestseller in 1957 in Latin America. I learned about Buran, interestingly, uh, at Stanford where I was associated with the Center of Latin American Studies, when a group of Brazilian students, grad, uh, advanced students came to Stanford with the support of the US State Department, came to, to see what was happening at Stanford and I greeted them. And the first thing they said to me was, um, could you take us to see Paul Buran, whom I didn't know at the time. Yeah, so I called Buran and we went to his, his home that afternoon. We spent about eight hours with him. And uh, Buran, it's the same Buran who had written this book that everybody was interested in. I mentioned that because it's a kind of the beginning of, of a paradigmatic shift that uh, was occurring in Latin America, but also uh, outside of Latin America. And Frank, I think, was influenced by Buran. We launched the the journal with uh, those articles I had mentioned and included the one by Frank, which was um, of high interest because it was the first criticism of his work at a point when most of us in the United States were beginning to use his book on Latin America as a basic text uh, in, in introducing Latin America and to have, have a critical assessment of something that was shifting the paradigm was of, of great interest to us and to the readership of, of the journal. There were other uh, essays in that issue, um, in, including one by Rodolfo Stavenhagen, who talked about the seven theses of development and underdevelopment and was instrumental in he was a Mexican, Mexican scholar and he was instrumental in, in this shift. But there were also shifts elsewhere. There was Luis Vitale in Chile who uh, set forth uh, a whole new understanding of Chile in terms of development being viewed in a negative way rather than po positive through capitalism. And there was Gonzalez Casanova in, in Mexico who um, talked about center and periphery and uh, backwardness in, in Mexico. And there were the Brazilian group of Teotonio dos Santos, Fania Van Bira, and Rimaro Marini, who launched um, the most important discussion uh, from Brazil. And, and Teotonio dos Santos, especially because he published an article in the American Economic Review about dependency, it was the first formal theoretically oriented piece published in, in an economic journal and it, it in itself had some influence. So this was the way we began. And this issue kind of picks up off of like, it, it comes out of that history. And I wanted to hold hold up a copy for the, vi the people who are gonna see this on video. This issue is, um. It's fantastic because it does such a good job, I think, of of discussing parts of that history and the various debates that dependency came out of and was engaged in. And uh, this is among the many Latin American perspectives issues that I've done these podcasts on. This might be the one I'm the most excited about. I've pretty much read this cover to cover in the past week. It's fantastic. Now, I want to get into a discussion of what those debates were um, and and some of the a deeper theoretical understanding of these ideas uh but first i want to ask joanna if you would uh describe as briefly or or as extensively as you want uh what is dependency theory 
uh, I think some of our listeners might not be acquainted with it. And in particular, I'd like to understand a little more about the intellectual and historical origins and the fundamental ideas of the theory. I think that our listeners would benefit from that. Thank you, Alex. Uh, well, firstly, I need to thank Ron to uh, invite me to organize with him and edit this issue. It was a very important process uh, on uh, editing. And for me, it was uh, incredible to learn how Latin American perspectives uh, produce a lot of dialogue uh, behind, uh, behind the scenes, behind the wall, uh, because uh, all manuscripts are very much debated between reviewers and, and the authors. And that's a very important process to improve academic debate. And sometimes this, this is kind of in, invisible and we can see how much work it's done to produce an issue like that, including a two volume issue in that case. Uh, our issues, uh, our double issue, double volume issue had a lot on theoretical debates and uh, his, the history of theory and also some theoretical debates, debates updated to our times. We have also some intellectual history about all these uh, important militants and activists of the intellectuality of Latin America that had participated in this elaboration of dependency theory and development debates on the 60s, 70s and 80s. And also we have some case studies that uh, sometimes try to demonstrate how useful those theories still are in our moment, in our present. So dependency theories are very heterogeneous. In fact, there are different branches of it. And that's the statement. I think it's the first statement we, it's important to do. Uh, the first formulations of dependency theories were produced as a criticism on the development theory from the ECLAC, Economic Commission of Latin American and Caribbean, uh, or CEPAL in, in Espanol, in the end of the 60s and the beginning of the 70s. And uh, ECLAC economists basically believe a lot in the national state's power to produce industrial policies for Latin America, even if it contradicts some foreign interests. Uh, of course, within ECLAC, there were also divergences and polemics. We know, for example, that Celso Furtado had different conceptions about the role of United States than uh, Raul Prebisch had. Uh, Prebisch basically was the author of the Carta de Punta del Este uh, of uh, Alliance for Progress in 1961. And he was kind of convinced that, uh, of the need of Alliance for Progress with Kennedy against the Cuban revolution. But other ECLAC members were more skeptical about the national state power to industrialize Latin America in harmony with international capital. So they, they see possible conflicts between Latin America industrialization and the US interests. Uh, anyway, what happened in the middle 60s was that the failure of Alliance for Progress strategy uh, which means the failure of the capitalist strategy adopted by US and a clock in Latin America. And we have the triumph of the authoritarian strategy for the so-called modernization and industrialization. So in 1964, we have Brazilian coup d'etat and Bolivian coup d'etat, followed by uh, the 73 coup d'etat of Chile and Uruguay, and then in, in 76, the Argentinian coup d'etat. All of them were conducted by US government in some level. So the theory of dependency emerges as an alert that national developmentalism was confronting external forces that were underestimated by a clock and other agents. That is why the process of economic development was being blocked by the problem of dependency and ECLAC had made ineffective diagnosis about it. So th this is, it can be considered the ground zero of dependency theory, which had an epicenter in Brazilian intellectuality as Ron was saying, uh, was telling. Uh, 
But soon two rival branches appeared and the first one was from Fernando Henrique Cardoso and Enzo Faleto that defended development programs should, that development programs should consider or reconsider the inevitability of dependent condition, which means uh, it, it would be possible to create new possibilities of conciliation between the internal needs and the external interests. The associated development, the idea of interdependency between the periphery and the core capitalism, and the catching up strategy were their formula, the catching up in terms of technology and economic development. But in the other side, there was the Marxists from the radical left that agreed firstly that Latin American capitalist developed, development were blocked by dependency, but for them, it means that the only path for development was anti-capitalism and the socialist revolution. So the Cuban history indeed was proven that in, the front, in front of everybody's eyes that socialist revolution was the path for development. Dependency theories had in common the category of dependency in the center of Latin American problems, but their branches are antagonists about how to deal with the real dependency. And in one side, we have the, we can say the Weberian version of dependency theory led by Fernando Henrique Cardoso that believe in conciliation between development and dependency through the programs, through programs better prepared to deal with the inevitability of international hierarchies. Uh, on the other side, we have the Marxist version of dependency theory that believed that there, there was no possible conciliation between development and dependency. And the only way to break with that dependency cycle was through socialism. That is probably the simple, simplest way to tell this story. Ron, do you want to add anything to that about uh, to describe the debates around dependency theory that took place in the 70s and 80s? Yeah, well, uh, in, in the introduction, uh, I talk about once the journal was launched, the four debates that ensued in the next 15 to 20 years, really up into the early 1990s. The first debate was the one that, that emerged in the first issue, which I made reference to, but I did not, uh, I need to identify that what really sparked uh, the debate within our group was uh, an essay by Raul Fernandez and Jose Ocampo, a Colombian social scientist who were at the University of California, Irvine, and who joined the founding group of editors, there were 12 of us, who had written a piece attacking dependency theory, all the theories uh, that Joanna has referred to, and reverting to a Marxist, Leninist, Maoist position that emphasized Marx's thinking uh, in its foundation and objecting to, to the new thinking in Latin America as leading to no serious understanding. This essay was presented in an informal grouping of the 12 of us who founded the journal because Fernandez and Ocampo were part of the, of the original essays, uh, original uh, editors. And they presented this over a period of an hour or so. We had invited Howard Sherman from UC Riverside, a Marxist economist, well known uh, in the United States and around the world to critique the presentation. He did critique it. Uh, the group discussed it. We decided even though the rest of us objected to it, to publish it, as a lead article in the issue. This was important because, because, and it's what provoked the interest in the journal because that first issue when it came out, it was immediately, it was immediately distributed around the world. We sold, we, we sold 2000 copies within a month. Um, the subscriber base of the journal was established because, because of this debate. There were objections written to it, uh, one by Timothy Harding, who was of the group, another by, Fernando Enrique Cardoso, the um, 
a Brazilian sociologist who we will talk about later. Who would later become president of Brazil. Yeah, absolutely. And who changed his, his thinking as well. So um, this, uh, this issue really represented the first debate uh, within the journal. And this is described in some detail in our, in our introduction. The uh, second debate focused around imperialism because Fernando and, and Ocampo had emphasized that imperialism, not dependency, was the concept to focus on. Imperialism has, had been part of, of the concern of progressive thinking in the United States and Europe, but it was looking at things from the outside. What was important about the early dependency ideas was that most of them were evolving and emanating from inside the countries, inside the countries that were um, a concern, uh, beginning with the ECLA discussions, the debates. Uh, so that evolved in another issue. And then there was a third debate in 1981, uh, which uh, dealt with uh, the relevance of dependency to Marxist theory. And uh, because we were struggling through these years to figure out what really was Marxist about the dependency theory. It's the same, same question that Fernandez and Ocampo were asking about. And we were within the material that we were receiving and we were publishing, we had become somewhat disillusioned about it. Um, the fourth debate was published in the spring of 1990 and dealt with the question of post-Marxism because uh, Ernesto Leclau, an Argentine social scientist and uh, Chantal Mofi had debated the relevance of Marxism and began to talk in different, in different style. There was a debate going on in, in uh, Southern Latin America, mostly in Argentina and Chile, but also in Brazil, that we sort of ignored thinking it was irrelevant. But eventually uh, in early 1990s, we did come back to it and we published an issue on it, which pretty much discredited uh, the debates and all the thinking of, of, of that which had been going on. So these were the, the major debates in, in the journal. And they, uh, thereafter, we continued to receive material on dependency, but we did publish very little. And uh, it seemed like certainly the idea of dependency, but also even Marxism began to fade in the background as, as the analysis of, of whatever we were looking at uh, pertained. Well, I'm hoping that with this new issue, we can begin to recenter dependency and Marxism in the analysis of a lot of the work that's being published in the journal. Um, but you already started to touch on this, but I'm hoping that we can we can unpack it a little more. So you were referring to Marxist and imperialist theories of, of development. Um, I think it's important that we discuss how Marxist and Marxist-Leninist approaches to political economy uh, differ from some of the dependency approaches, and, and specifically with looking at Latin America. And then I'd, I'd also like to hear both of your thoughts on were these differences in debates that we're talking about amongst these theorists and theories, were they contained to intellectual and academic circles? Or did they manifest in real political movements and projects in Latin America? So I think that the main feature of this intellectual generation from the 60s, 70s, is that they are all very committed with some political project. And, and many of those intellectuals were not just theoretical, they were very engaged on movements and part, political parties. And they have this activism that uh, was uh, a pretty much uh, interesting experience to put their ideas in practice. Uh, there was a lot of uh, rivalry and polemics in, within the left wing this period. So I, I will say that the Marxist-Leninist approaches that are identified better with the communist parties in Latin America, 
they were uh, still very much uh, convicted about the idea of the stages of development and the idea uh, that in the peripheral capitalism, the bourgeoisie still have some role to, to make, some role to, to accomplish in the industrialization and the development of capitalism before any socialist revolution could be mature enough to be made and produced. But then the Cuban revolution uh, put this thesis upside down because the Cuban revolution was made in an agrarian country by peasants and by working class. And the uh, Cuban bourgeoisie's b- bourgeoisie was weak to do any development. And it was, re- it was very much clear that the Cuban bourgeoisie would never be able to like uh, drop uh, Batista from power as the Fidel Castro movement did. And then this uh, different branch of Marxists that, that were uh, alternative uh, from the Marxist-Leninist traditional approaches of the communist parties, uh, started to develop in the, the dependency theory uh, in Marxism terms. So we can say that uh, dependency theory, it, it, Marxist dependency theory are pretty much, is pretty much identified with this group of the radical left wing that believed uh, in the um, uh, an evil and an equal an even and an equal development that was very that were very much inspired on Samir Amin ideas, for example, and that have some sympathy for Trotsky and that believe that the socialist revolution was a, a emergent emergent task and a, an urgent task and uh, working class from Latin America and the peasants from Latin America shouldn't wait any capitalist development in, in terms of industrialism before doing its uh, popular revolution themselves. So I think that uh, all of them was very committed with theory and practice. It's kind of different from our days today where we have a more clear division between professional militants and intellectual and professional intellectuals. I think that on those times, everybody was kind of formulating intellectually and also uh, in practice, um, but they have this this uh, antagonisms inside the left wing that basically can be synthesized by the antagonism that were were uh, pretty much intense within the Chilean left wing under the Via Chilena al Socialismo and Salvador Allende government. Yeah, I want to. Um... I want to emphasize that in the debates that took place within the journal, the search was to find what where the Marxism in a dependency approach really could be articulated in writing. Our third debate was an issue around Marxism and dependency in which each, each of these debates we had were deal, dealing with the problem of what really, it's really the problem that Fernandez and Ocampo raised initially in the journal. What is it that is useful uh, in a Marxist sense in these ideas that were being written about? We found so much of the writing unacceptable. We turned down a lot of material. Uh, but this last issue was, was interesting because uh, it not only was published as an issue, but also as a book. And we kind of came to the conclusion that we really didn't want to focus on dependency material thereafter. The fourth debate on post-Marxism some years later, a few years later, was an attempt to also deal with what's going on beyond beyond this Marxist dependency idea, the post-Marxist, which we were very, very critical of. It was the feeling in general that in Latin America, intellectuals concerned with this thinking because almost all Latin America had fallen to dictatorships, especially in Brazil, it had long dictatorship from lasted from 64 up until the early 1980s. 
that it was difficult for intellectuals to express themselves uh, in a Marxist way. When I first met Teotonio dos Santos in 1964, it was just a few months after the coup, and I met him in clandestinity in Rio. He was hiding from, he had been expelled from the University of Brasilia, where he was a political scientist. Uh, he was uh, in hiding and he, he stayed that way for the better part of a year and then had to leave for, for Chile. It was in Chile where uh, Cardoso and others also came together in a, in a grouping called, uh, uh, had the acronym CESO. And they talk, began to talk about these ideas outside of that milieu. So I think the, the uh, repression, the complexity for an intellectual made it difficult to, to write in a Marxist sense or even to pursue what was Marxism about it on the one hand. But on the other hand, the period of authoritarianism also left intellectuals, some of them thinking more seriously about the theoretical implications of development. And that's why we had this paradigmatic change and we began to shift our thinking from the traditional economic thinking of Europe and the United States that capitalism was a, was a positive form of development in these countries of Latin America. And to some extent, I think that was occurring even today with the pink tide governments that were moving in progressive ways after the turn of the century, uh, encountering resistance and some changes, coup in Bolivia, changes in Ecuador, and so forth, in which the direction began to move differently, um, which may, and Joanna may not agree with this, may have actually stimulated some of the, the intellectual thinking that we're now dealing with today. That's kind of a, a notion I have in the back of my mind. But it, I want to just finish this, this, this concern that you have by reading to you uh, just a brief statement that's in, in the journal that's drawn from that issue on Marxism and dependency, and which led to, to our marginalizing the whole theory at, at that stage of the late 1980s. We wrote, those interested in dependency have recognized that no general and unified theory exists and that confusion over terminology has diverted investigation away from central concerns. The criticisms raised are numerous. It has been argued that some theories of dependency distort the thought of Marx and Lenin. Idealism and ideology permeate the writing on dependency. Some versions of dependency focus on the needs of competitive capital and thus appear to be supportive of the dominant classes of Latin America. Dependency may divert attention from the impact of imperialist penetration or over overlook the importance of pre-capitalist formations. Dependency theory may emphasize static categories so that dynamic and dialectical analysis is not possible. Class analysis, for example, is lacking due to stress on relations of exchange rather than relations of production. That was a very concise kind of conclusive finding of the editorial collective at that time. And that explains why we went into this period of uh, some 20 plus years where, where there was very little discussion about about the, about the whole notion of dependency. Um, I wanna mention some of the theoretical thinking that was going on alongside of dependency theory to make clear that there really was a lot of important intellectual work going on and published, but dealing with the same ideas, but using different kinds of approaches and terminology. And I wrote in uh, my book, and I cited it in this article, a brief reference to this literature. And I divided the theories of capitalist and socialist development into two categories. One, reformist, nationalist, and capitalist. And here we find the thinking of 
what I call inward development, represented by Ralph Prebish, Osvaldo Suncal, and Celso Furtado, who were part of that ECLA group that Joanna referred to. Secondly, an idea of poles of development represented by Francois Perrault of France, which had some currency and some interests. Thirdly, the internal colonialism of Gonzalez Casanova in Mexico. Fourthly, the associated dependent capitalist development, which we'll talk about more of, of Fernando Enrique Cardoso, because Cardoso diverged from the Marxist mainstream of dependency that Joanna is, is drawing most of her discussion from. Nextly, world systems analysis by Emmanuel Wallerstein. I recall writing to, to Wallerstein about participating in that issue on Marxism and dependency that I referred to. And his reply was something to the effect, um, we only need to focus on, on world system, not Marxism. That sounds like a world systems theorist. That's like a classic world systems theorist. Important statement because later we're going to talk about, about this world systems approach and the Marxist approach to dependency that we bring out in one of our book reviews in the issue. And finally is the regulation theory by Agrieto. That was just one side of it. That was the reformist side. That's, that's one, way, one way I take a look at it. On the other side, I looked at it as the revolutionary socialist. And I think this is getting closer to what Joanna has described. Uh, the early dependency ideas of uh, Silvia Frondizi in Argentina, uh, for example, um, notions of backwardness and surplus as in Paul Baran, capitalist development of underdevelopment as in Frank, which we already mentioned, the new dependency idea of Tejone dos Santos, which was so tremendously important in shifting thinking in the United States. The unequal development notions of Samir Amin. The unequal exchange ideas of Manuel. The late capitalism of Mandel. The combined and uneven development theories of Leon Trotsky. And the modes of production approach of, of Ray. In this discussion and focus on Marxism and non-Marxism, uh, that's one way to take a lot of interesting and exciting ideas that are brought about by this paradigmatic shift without any consensus about where to go. But that's where we, that's where we got to uh, in the last, at the end of the last century. I, re I really appreciate you uh, explaining it in that way. I feel like that's a really useful way to categorize and, and sort of place these different ideas into specific groups. And uh, I did want to go back to something Joanna mentioned earlier about how in the past, there wasn't this clear division between the intellectual class and the political class and the type, the type of work that people were doing where at the time when these theories emerged, the stakes were very high. And a lot of these people were engaged in very serious political organizing and movements. And, uh, the fact that it's a little different now to me is, is a slight tragedy, but we don't have enough time to go into all of that. But I do want to, uh, you've already started to talk about this. So there is this clear division between the more revolutionary Marxist leaning theories and the more, I think, as you said, reformist oriented theories. Now, Joanna, why is the incorporation of a Marxist approach to theories of dependency so valuable? I feel like this issue makes that very clear, but I was hoping you could uh, address that. I think uh, the, the Marxist categories and the Marxist theory, uh, it's uh, essential to understand the concept of dependency in Latin America. And then I can also dialogue with something that Ron's, Ron was telling about, uh, that is this criticism on the idea of a dependency theory in, within the Marxist theory uh, that says that uh, the Marxist dependency theory focuses much more on exchange relations than on production relations. And I think that the theoretical improvement that the Marxist theory of dependency had produced 
is that uh, to is to articulate the exchange relations between center and peripheral countries with the production relations in peripheral countries and how those uh, those different dimensions of capitalist exploitation are uh, essentially uh, joined in one single system of exchange and production. So the unequal exchange and the, the, the hierarchies between peripheral countries and the central countries from the capitalist economy are directly re related with how production relations uh, work or uh, not work in social terms in the periphery countries. And I think that like Mauro Marini, for example, shows and demonstrated pretty much uh, when he developed the concept of super exploitation of labor. And we have a couple of articles on our issues about that. And why super exploitation of labor is a standard form of capitalism in Latin America and also in other peripheral countries and how the super exploitation is a structural aspect also of a, a, a standard or a pattern of international relations exchange between, cap between uh, the, the, the center and the peripheral countries. And I think that that's a very important dialectical contribution of Marxist theory of dependency that uh, overcome the idea that we focus on exchange relations or in production relations that, that can be a polarization between uh, different kinds of Marxism. And the Marxist theory of dependency shows how they are ver very much connected. The, the perspective of the totality uh, it can explain better how exploitation, uh, capitalist exploitation works in, in the whole world. So uh, in another sense, I think it's important to understand how those intellectuals were very much uh, victims of the dictatorships on Latin America and how their theoretical production was also affected by that because they were political activists and they were running uh, against uh, persecutions and they were exiled a lot of times sequ sequentially and uh, that's why for example Claudio Katz says that the Marxist theory of dependency had three intellectual cycles one would be the Brazilian the other would be the Chilean and the third the Mexican because those intellectuals who were products in these theories they had to flee from the countries where there were coup d'etat. So first they were in Brazil, and then especially Rui Mauro Marini, Teotônio dos Santos, Vânia Bambirra, and also Andres Gunder Frank were in Universidade de Brasília. And they, fought, they formed the so-called Brazilian group. That's uh, also a, a, a subject of one of the articles of our issue. And they were like a counterpoint of the University of Sao Paulo group that were led by Fernando Henrique Cardoso. And the, this Brazilian group uh, were very militant, in, involved with Polopi, that uh, is, was a political group in Brazil called Politica Operaria, that were created in 1961 to press João Goulart to the left and to struggle for the Brazilian revolution. But then there was the coup d'etat, and this group was persecuted and the dictatorship were, were very directly against them. And they had to flee and they went to Chile. And in Chile, the idea of Marxist theory of dependency grew a lot uh, in these interactions between different Latin American intellectuals, because Chile in the end of the 60s and the beginning of the 70s were like a capital of Latin, Latin American left wing. So there were a lot of different national, uh, different nations uh, represented there. And uh, there were Chilean, Peruvian, Colombian, Argentinian and Mexican intellectuals from the left wing that were in Chile. And this group of Brazil could enjoy this good environment of development and they founded the CESU, the Centro de Estudios Socioeconomicos in, in La Universidad de Chile. And they lived like five or six or seven years there. 
And in this period, they were very much productive, including uh, analyzing the Chilean situation that was emblematic. And we can exemplify it by the, the Dos Santos work that was called Socialist or Fascist, the new character of, the, of dependency at Latin American dilemmas. That is a very classic work of Latin American dependency, but also Bambija wrote Capitalismo Dependente Latinoamericano and uh, Marini published Under Development and Revolution and after uh, Dialectic of Dependency that were very important works on in this time. Uh, also, we can uh, mention Orlando Caputo Roberto Pissarro, Pio Garcia, Marta Harnecker, Cristóbal Cai, and many, many other Chileans, Marxist Chileans that were involved in these discussions. And then with the Chilean coup d'etat in 73, everybody had to flee. And it was a very tra tragic end to Salvador Allende government. And it was very dangerous to be in Chile under Pinochet. So part of them went to Mexico and then there they lived more stabilized career in the university and could still produce. So this, these intellectuals in Mexico, especially the Brazilian ones, wrote a lot in Spanish. And it's curious that in Brazil, that is still some of the works that were never published in Portuguese. I mean, Teotonio dos Santos had some works that were published in Spanish and then in and many other languages and then in Chinese, but it was published in Portuguese like five years ago or four years ago because of this kind of uh, distance or, or censorship that operated in the intellectual environment of Brazil. And of course, I, I agree with Ron that the kind of resurrection of dependency debates in Brazil and in other Latin American countries have a lot to do with this, uh, this resurrection of the national bourgeoisie illusions uh, that were like uh, raised by the neo-developmentalist period cycle and the pink tide. So I think that dependency theories in the Marxist per perspective were updated right now. And that is pretty much because also development theories were updated in the neoliberal context and that the present we live now. Let me jump in uh, just for a moment. I was uh, also in Chile in 1971 and 72 and I had of course known Cardoso and Furtado and uh, Teotonio and Vanya before in the, in the more repressive period of Brazilian dictatorship, but there the coming together of these people who had different views about dependence. Our thinking at that time was, and, and, and later, was that Marini was the only one who really systematically related his thinking to Marx. And for that reason, in the journal, we have published maybe five or six manuscripts over the years about Marini's Marxism independence. It's almost the only uh, overt uh, referencing to Marx and Marxism uh, in the writings about dependency. This was the dilemma. So Marini was of great interest. He was a founding, all these, all these people were founding editors, editors of the journal, by the way, including Cardoso, Marini, Dos Santos, Vania Bambiera, and so on. So, of course, the 73 coup overthrew the Allende regime and brought an end to all of this and forced Teotonio and Vania to move to Mexico. And Marini had generally been disillusioned, uh, uh, not so excited about about Chile, although he was there for a period of time, but he was mostly in Mexico. And just one point in relation to what uh, Joanna was talking about that I think is important is inside Brazil, these writers were not well known at that time. Dos Santos came back uh, with Vanya. They were married in the early years. I came back in the early 1980s as Brazil was moving away from dictatorship into a political opening and five political parties emerged. 
uh, Teotonian actually ran for the governorship of, of uh, Minas Gerais, believe it or not. The problem was that they were unknown and Brazilians didn't know about much of these ideas. Some did, but they were not represented broadly in academia. Marini was always very discouraged. I was in Brazil frequently, and he tended to be there most of the time I was there, but he was always retreating to Mexico. And I remember the last time I saw him, was was in the late, uh, maybe early 90s. He had uh, come to Brazil. He had been wounded by a bank robber where he, he was just, just happened to be in the vicinity and the robber shot his gun and, and the bullet had hit his, his arm and caused a big problem. He went back to Mexico after that. And I don't think he really came back to Brazil for any lengthy period of time thereafter. So they weren't really well known in Brazil. And that's the point I'm trying to make. You already touched upon briefly neo-developmentalism in Latin America and how that was sort of a shift in these debates around dependency and economic development. So I'd love to hear your thoughts a little bit more about what constituted neo-developmentalism and how there was a Marxist or neo-Marxist response to that. And uh, Joanna, I believe, mentioned earlier that Latin American scholars are returning to the fundamental questions that animated the dependency debates originally. Uh, and the debates around Marxism and dependency. So I just would love to hear both your thoughts on these these issues. Well, to to deal with that, let me refer to to the introduction to the first issue because it does discuss briefly neo developmentalism and the Marxist theory of dependency. And I, I want to explain that when we were putting together the issue, and I think it's important for me to Joanna described the amount of work involved in putting this material together. Joanna read and evaluated, I think, every one of the 60-some manuscripts that were submitted and forced authors who we were interested in to revise two, three, four times. A tremendous amount of effort has gone into this. And as, the, as that evolved, our original approach shifted a bit because for me, at least, um, I was looking at the contrast between Marxist theory of, of dependency and neo-developmentalism. And I thought it might be interesting at the beginning of the issue to juxtapose those two positions because the, the Marxist and the neo-Marxist critiquing of neo-developmentalism was somewhat limited in the material that we received. We expected to, to see more debate in this direction. It didn't, it didn't really take place, even in the stuff that was not included. But we did, we were able, this view was able to come out in some of the very interesting uh, essays, especially in this first issue, uh, which pointed out the differences between, oh, for example, the Cardoso approach and uh, the Marxist approach. But Ronaldo Monk, editor of Latin American Perspectives, I invited him and also Bresser Pereira, Luis Carlos Bresser Pereira, uh, an economist in Brazil, to present these two positions. And my thinking originally was to, to include that somewhere at the outset of the issue. And Bresser Pereira did submit a brief piece which looked at economic development in Brazil and in Latin America in its various phases over time, which I thought was an instructive background for the readership. And he ended up with the neo-developmental approach, which is his approach, but also was an approach that uh, evolved within the uh, pink tide governments that came the progressive governments that came to power after the turn of the century. And, and, so, and I invited Ronaldo Monk to present the other side. So what happened was th there was no material to support that position in the debate. The prospectus called for this contrast, but we didn't really have much. We had no advocacy of that position. And it seemed irrelevant to proceed with that. 
So I asked Monk to, I was thinking of the possibility of presenting that dichotomy by having a, an analysis, brief analysis of the one approach in contrast to the other. So Renato Monk, who has written some recent books, two of which uh, I reviewed in this issue, um, he is very lucid and very interesting in terms of trying to understand Marxism or the Marxism of capitalism, uh, of capitalist critique and, and approach, and how Marxism relates to development. His two recent books are, are very helpful in that regard. So uh, he, he writes the following, and I'm just drawing from the issue. The approach to development known as neo desiroismo or developmentalism emerged during the high neoliberal era when the market ruled supreme. The state was written out of the story and subordinated integration into the world economy was posed as the only option for Latin America. This neo-developmentalism, that is, development would have something to do with the outside world, made some concessions to neoliberalism, such as acceptance that there was no option to integration into the global economy. That's important. The notion of delinking was clearly not a viable one, now if ever there was. What it did articulate very clearly was the need for state intervention in the developmental process. The notion of unregulated market as the key to development, which had prevailed in all the authoritarian regimes, it was firmly rejected. It also argued for a stronger industrialization policy and understood the importance of the internal market. Its slogan was growth with e equity. That's kind of helps to understand a little bit about this notion of neo-development. He goes on though to say, and I just want to read just a little bit more, the neo-Marxist dependency school, he calls it neo-Marxist, that emerged not only adopted a critical view of, of neo-developmentalism, charging it with reformism and was simply recycling the old inward looking 1950s development doctrines of the ECLA, Economic Commission for Latin America and Caribbean, and basically representing a continuity with a neoliberal model that had prevailed since the 1990s. These scholars sought to revive the dependency approach of the 1970s, which had waned as a wave of third world industrialization transformed the development process and the quotes development of underdevelopment predicted failed to occur. This is how Monk is synthesizing and understanding what was happening at the turn of the century. It's important to understand that because these ideas on neo-developmental neo developmentalism are emerging at this time. Brissa Pereira takes these ideas and it develops them in theoretically and into a manifesto. I think it was, forgotten the year, but uh, a few years, many in this midst of all this period, I think it was 1902 or 2003, and has a, a conference of some 80 scholars, I think 79 of them signed on to a statement of, of neo-developmentalism uh, being an alternative course to the prevailing and past approaches to development in Latin America and the third world. Yeah, I think that our issue, it's interesting in terms of connect the old development and independence debates with the new ones. And that's not uh, an easy task because they con their connection are not obvious and they're not automatic. But I agree with Ron that uh, this new now developmentalist cycle had uh, a lot of limits and had in incorporated some neoliberal uh, structures inside their paradigm. And this means especially that the neo developmentalist cycle 
recycle recycled some uh, we can say old illusions about Latin American bourgeoisie ability to invest and lead a development process. And they uh, also have in common all these uh, the pink tide governments that were different. They have different levels of class confrontation, for example, and different levels of different degrees of uh, class conciliation. If we compare like what was Brazilian and Venezuelan experience of the pink tide, they were very, very much different. But they have in common the neo-extractivism strategy and what Maristela Svampa, this Argentinian sociologist, called the commodity consensus. Uh, including this consensus was not about only the pink tide, but about all Latin American countries, including those that were outside the pink tide. And like, for example, Peru and Colombia. So I think that another, another important feature of the neo-developmentalists is, is that their approach to inequalities, they prioritize the World Bank paradigm of social programs Rather than deal with poverty, rather than deal with inequalities in a structural way, so they produce those uh, poverty uh, policies that are very much fragile in the capitalist structure and can be destroyed in a single year. There is no stability in the conquest of the pink tide. They can be destroyed very fast. So I think that this resurrection or reborn of the Marxist theory, Marxist theory of dependence had to do with that. It's a very strong critique against these illusions or these recycled in illusions created by neo-developmentalist governments. And again, that there was the need to remember that it's impossible to reform and development dependent capitalism because its structure is based on violence, on super exploitation of labor, of uh, structural unemployment. And uh, we have an internal bourgeoisie that is aggressively anti-national and anti-popular. So I think that also we, we can say that the Marxist theory of dependency is limited in different ways. And although we can say that they update interesting points of the capital of the critic of capitalism in the periphery also the political perspective of marxist theory of dependency we can say is kind of distant of the working class reality so neoliberalism is very powerful in kidnap subjectivities so now we are living in a moment where working class do not think about overcoming capitalism, but how to win in this capitalist competition. And that is why uh, these new Marxist approaches have a deep difficulty to, to penetrate in the uh, present subjectivity of the working class. So it's not that the Marxist theory of dependency have the right answers for, for the problems we have in Latin America, because if it was like that, Obviously, we won't have this huge growth of the right wing and the extreme right in Latin America. So uh, we have uh, a deep problem uh, related to how, how to articulate this new theory, this updated theory with the reality of the working class in Latin America. And I think it's not a, a smallest problem. It's like a strategic problem. So to, to resume, I will say that our issue articulates the historical theoretical debates, the intellectual history of those militants that were also formulators of the development and dependency debates in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Also, we, we have some updated theory and we have some case studies. In the second volume, we have at least six studies about the Brazilian dependency and new developmentalists in some cases, two studies about Argentinian capitalism and one about Ecuador and one about Mexico, Ecuador, Colombia, and Brazil, and also other countries. Lastly, I, was, I will talk a little bit about the book reviews I made in the second volume, 
It's about two books, one from Maristela Svampa that I mentioned before. There is a book, a book called Latin American Debates. It was published in Argentina uh, with the title Debates Latinoamericanos, Desarrollo, Dependencia, Populismo, y Desarrollo, Dependencia y Populismo. And the other book is uh, Fabio Luis Barbazo dos Santos' book that is a Brazilian historian. And his book is called Una Historia de la Ola Progresista in America Latina from 1998 to 2016. And both books are, had different methods and different approaches. Maristela Svampa made a very long durée approach from all 20th century and 21st century, resuming all debates about dependencia, desarrollo, populismo, indigenismo. And it's a, an important synthesis, very useful in Latin American studies, in undergrad level and also in graduate level. And Fabio Luis focused on the new 20th century cycle. So the, both books from Svampa and Fabio Luis Barbosa dos Santos have this uh, diagnosis method, and they are very much concerned in explain the limits of neo-development and the actual dependency in Latin America today. And that's important also to feed in some way the militant practice and the political perspectives uh, from now on. So I think they are theoretical and historical books, but they have also a, a very engaged way of putting the problems and analyzing our reality today. So Ron, you, you also wrote a review of two books for this issue. And uh, did you want to briefly talk about that? Just, just briefly, because <clears throat> one of the both books are, are published by Brill, and uh, I think also published in the United States by Haymarket Books. The first is Carlos Eduardo Martin's book on dependency, neoliberalism, and globalization of Latin America. And the other is by Ruben Sawaya on subordinated development, transnational capital in the process of accumulation of Latin America and Brazil. But it's the Martins book that's really important. Carlos Eduardo Martins has gone back into all of the earlier work on dependency and digested it into what he calls the Marxist theory of dependency. This uh, is kind of a bold approach to the whole question because we've raised doubts along the way. We've raised questions about the debates that have occurred. We've made clear that not all the theoretical questions are settled, but Martins goes back to the work of especially Dos Santos, Bambira, and Munk. In one of the essays by Leda Maria Palani, also goes back to those three thinkers and their work as summarized by them later in life in memorials which were required in the 1990s so that they could be reinstated in the university in Brazil. And, they, and, and I read them at the time and they were very interesting. They're about 150 pages long and they were biographical statements about what they had been doing over the years. And there they begin to draw out the Marxist influences in their work, which are never referred to in their writings that were actually published in the earlier period. In this essay by Bacalani, she, she goes into that in some depth to make very clear what the Marxist influence is, because this was always a question in the earlier years. What Carlos Mar Eduardo Martins does, he goes back, he draws from that work, and he draws from Marx to demonstrate that their work was Marxist. And he does this in a very definitive way, and he asserts that there is definitely a Marxist theory of dependency. This is an aggressive stance. It's one that I questioned initially, but when I worked my way through his book, I found it extremely interesting. 
is some 350 pages. And it goes into the international side of, of the question by drawing upon Emmanuel Wallerstein, whom we mentioned earlier in our discussion, and his world system theory. And he, because he, he's, he's convinced that to have a theory, it must relate not only internally to what's happening in development, but to externally what's happening in the world economy as well. And he uses the Wallerstein model of world system as a means to uh, work that through theoretically, which he does. Therefore, I think it's an important contribution and it justifies this assertion that finally, after all these years, there is a Marxist theory of dependency. Those both sound incredible. I'm going to go order a copy of each right after this. Those were all the questions I had for you both today, but I, I just want to thank you for coming and making this time to meet with me. Your dual issue is, is out now. It's available at Sage and uh, through latinamericanperspectives.com. And it, it's absolutely incredible. And I just think the work that you're doing and have done for this issue and are continuing to do on bringing attention to these theories and this political history is, is incredible. So thank you so much for the work you both do. Thank you, Alex. That is all the time we have for today, but thank you for listening in. The new issues, Reassessing Development, Dependency Theories and Debates from Latin American Perspectives can be accessed through our website at latinamericanperspectives.com or Sage Publishing. Check the show notes for information on how you can get in contact with myself, the journal, or Ron and Joanna. If you enjoy the show and would like to receive updates about Latin American news, current events, and content from our journal, Please don't forget to follow us on any or all of our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And please, be sure to listen in to our next podcast.